This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found on Gadget Geek show number 378, recorded on November 8th, 2018. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Carlson, broadcasting live from the Average Guy at TV studios here in a kind of a chilly. I think we're, Mike, we're expecting some snow in the morning. I think a little bit flurries really just. There were some flurries already today around yeah, the, I heard about in the afternoon. I guess I didn't get outside to see those, but uh, snow is on its way. John, are you, you worried about the snow at all? John, by the way, John Larson's with us, Omaha guy. John, you worried about the snow at all? Um, not as such. It shouldn't be a terrible amount. Luckily, I have a Subaru all-wheel drive, so that yeah, helps back, me get through. Back on the weekend, they were saying three to six inches for yesterday, or actually mm. for voting, uh, you know, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So that they it never, it never happens. So you know, of course, you can you can always rely on the forecast to get it wrong, and then they won't call it, and we'll get a foot, you know, of snow coming in. So yep. Um, well, we're all like I mentioned. John is uh, John is our good friend. He's been on the show a bunch of times. I think John, this is your fourth show with us, mm-hmm. and he's a local Omaha guy. So we're all Omaha tonight. So get ready for some inside Omaha jokes. I'm, I'm sure they're coming. <laughs> We, uh, we do want to remind everybody, if you want to get access to the show notes, and tonight's show notes are going to be pretty good, you're going to want to go out and get them. Uh, head out to theaverageguy.tv. For this one, it would be a, then a slash HGG378 if you want to get there. Or if it's like in the next week or two, it's just right on the front page. You can get access to them there. Check out the show notes. Don't forget, you can also get us on the mobile app. I listen to that every Tuesday on my way into work. I flip over just to hear how things sound on that. And I listen. I don't listen to the whole show, but it's a great way to do it. You can listen on the road streams, not download. It's an app that goes right on your phone, and you can just you don't have to go into any kind of play or anything. It just is home gadget geeks. Those of you who support us at Patreon help pay for that, and we appreciate you doing that. Head out to homegadgetgeeks.com, and you can get that Android, iPhone, either one of them. It's absolutely free. Download it just so you have it. If you're on the road and you want to stream us, it is by far the easiest way to do it. So get it. Get it today. Just have it so you, in case of an emergency, homegadgetgeeks.com. Big congratulations to Erin Lawrence. Two weeks ago, she was on here. We were talking about getting her to 10,000 subs, 10,000 subscriptions on YouTube. She hit that today or yesterday or sometime soon. That's Mike, 10,000. That's a big number. It is. It is. Especially, you know, you start to get to that 10,000 point, I think. And that's really where your, you know, your trajectory actually goes. It's like a hockey stick, right? It's real slow in the beginning. But I think 10,000 is right around that sweet spot where you can really start to take off. YouTube starts, you know, prioritizing your videos a little bit more and the recommendations. So I'm excited for her. I think, I think she's at the, you know, she's been doing such great content. And I think, she, you know, she deserves all the subs and the views in the world. She's doing a great job. If you haven't uh, done that, go back to show 376. And uh, the links to her channels and such are there. You can still subscribe to them if you want to. And uh, it's it's well worth it. She does a great job. She's very fair, very honest. You, you probably want to follow her. I'm, I think Home Gadget Geeks is going to take credit for that 10,000. She was on here. It takes us a couple weeks for everybody to listen to the show and to subscribe. So congratulations, Home Gadget Geeks listeners for getting Aaron. But Aaron, congratulations to you. Speaking of that, uh, if you're not following us in the Facebook group, you're missing out. Let me let me hold on. Let me grab this box really quick. I just got to show you something. This is maybe where you want to watch the the video part of it, man. But Mike, John, I got this big honking box. This thing is freaking heavy. This is the the EGVA power supply that we talked about in the Facebook group for sixty bucks. And sometimes those deals come and go pretty fast. You know, this is a seven hundred and fifty watt gold power supply supernova G plus. Doesn't that sound cool? By the way, ten year warranty on this bad boy. Um, Mike, you seem to think that maybe they over they over manufactured these for, for miners. Well that's what I was thinking. That's what I was wondering if they went down to sixty because I said I have that same one. I bought it back in the middle of the mining craze, right? Because I needed a a power supply for just my four GPUs. And it was like $150, between 130 and 150 I can't remember what it was. I mean, so you're talking less than half of that. I'm wondering if, you know, these got really popular and now that the mining craze has gone down a little bit, at least with GPUs, everyone's jumping up. If they are doing anything, they're jumping up to the higher level ones. Maybe they had a little bit of surplus. Maybe they, they overproduced. Now they need to clear out the shelves a little bit. I'm not sure. Is that the uh, modular version? 
It is the modular complete. That is amazing. I love the modular. It's amazing. It's, amazing. it's the only way to go. John, do you need a power supply? Is this 60 bucks? Are you going to jump on this thing? Well, I've been thinking about uh, building a new desktop PC, so that might be a, a pretty good deal. And I like that it has the name Supernova in it. Right. There you I, go. We're going to talk about uh, telescopes tonight, so so good foreshadowing of that. Um, Mike, here's the deal. As of tonight, recording, like a few minutes ago, still available, like, they're out. They must have made it just a crap load of these things. So oftentimes by the time we talk about them on the show, they are gone. Uh, not not right now. So if you want to head out to and I'll throw this link in the chat room as well. If you guys want to head out there and grab those free shipping, 60 bucks. I, I just so I was it came today and Sarah sent me a message and she was like, hey, we got this box from EGVA and it doesn't have a name on it. Like, did you order that? You know, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's the power supply. So I was opening it up and I said, you know, I don't really have a need for it at the moment, but it's be a good backup. She goes, oh, that'd be a totally great backup. I mean, you can't ever, like if a power supply goes down, you got to have it. I was like, all of a sudden I just, I stopped. I, like I, I, I didn't even know it, like w what alien has invaded your body. And yeah, it's right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that 752 should be more than enough, even if everyone's upgrading, you know, to the 2080 TIs, the new gen graphics cards. Uh, which I think take, is it two eight pin connectors for those 2080s? Um, wow. I mean, they just suck a lot of power, but I think the 750 actually should be enough. I think those things run, uh, I want to say between 450 and 500, maybe 400. So, I mean, depending on what your CPU is, it sh should be pretty decent. Yeah. So links in the show notes, links in the chat room. Uh, chances are, if you're listening this weekend, it's still available. I just have one as a backup. I'm eventually going to build another PC and so good to have around for a backup and uh, still available 60 bucks free shipping. Get that done. Um, don't forget, Mike and I, next week, we're doing a whole show on Black Friday deals. We want your deal. Send them to me, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. Kevin Schoonover sent me the link to, to all of Target's Black Friday deals. And that's kind of what we're looking for. The more you can narrow them in, the better. But we're starting to see a bunch of them come in. We've seen a bunch of SSDs. So we've seen just a bunch of things going on sale Black Friday. So got a Black Friday deal. Send it to me, Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. We will... Get those posted and then talk about them uh, next week. All right. I mentioned John is here. And uh, John, uh, why don't you give us, for folks who, it's been a while since you've been on, give us a little bit about who you are, who you work for, what you do as a day job. So every day I get to work with the uh, wonderful people at the AIM Institute. We're a nonprofit. We kind of grow and inspire and connect people along the Silicon Prairie for tech careers and uh, tech experiences. Um, in the last year and a half, most of the time, I'm doing system engineer work, right? But in the last year and a half, two years or so, I'm now working in our school programs with kids, giving them exposure to technology like Raspberry Pis, programming robots, circuits. Yeah, it's it's been an interesting change and it's very exciting to be out and about with all of them and working with them. No, oh, it's it's pretty cool. Every time I see you, you got a robot in your hand, you're doing something cool. Yep. This year, uh, when I saw you at Heartland Developer Conference, you guys were sporting some 3D printers. Mm -hmm. I've been super skeptical of 3D printing because it made a big splash and then has really kind of gone nowhere, at least in the in the major consumer market. And you said something to me like, oh, dude, like, hey, you can get this on mono price for like 160 bucks. And it got me. Through. Yeah. I was like, you know, maybe it's time. You know, I've got this empty shelf that's sitting over here. Maybe it's time that a 3D printer, it would be right up here. A 3D printer would show up here. I got some feedback from folks. As I mentioned that, they're like, oh, you definitely don't want to buy the small, you know, that the, the cheap ones because – it's this limitation and that, or you got one, you know, you, you, you have these options or not. If I'm, if I'm, you know, so talk me back into this, John, because the idea was that I would buy one, we'd do some projects with it. Mm -hmm. You guys were making little gadgets at the conference and stuff. Talk me back into a 3D printer. Why today as a tech guy or gal, should I have one? Do you have a hobby that needs parts replaced? Oh, hit, do you hit, need a new mic mount? right for your yeah. microphone somewhere i was going to build a robot lawnmower and use it for that so that yes yes i i, I do have a project hmm. where that would that could play in i don't know if i would 3d print my mower deck no no this was like but, shims and oh, okay small parts where i where i needed to fit things together like retro kind of fit them you know 
Yeah, so that would work. Yeah, I think so. Um, you can. For me, I've been using it to do telescope parts, and they're not altogether big parts. So the small printer works for me. Plus, I don't have a lot of money outlay on a large thousand dollar printer that I only use for a while, then I'm done. Or it has a bit more of a learning curve than some of the smaller ones. So for me, it was more of a price point so I could get up to speed and learn the printing processes before I might invest in a larger printer later on. So what size objects can that printer do, the smaller one? Um, it says uh, my printer is like uh, 120 by 120 millimeters. Okay. So you can easily print you know, something like this big on it. Was that printed on it? Is that one of your? Yeah. Mm-hmm. John, wow. what model do you have? What, which one did you buy? I have the uh, Monoprice Mini. Yeah, the Monoprice Mini. So like it's, it's the, it was like 220. Select printer. Yes, two. Mini Select. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get a, I'm going to get, so right now, 189.99. Does that sound about right? Oh, it's come down. Oh, I paid 220. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm going to, um, I'm going to put that in the both in the chat room here if folks want to follow along. It's kind of got a black tower on one side and uh, a, a flat surface to the right and a little mm -hmm. dial. Is that the right one? Okay. Um, and so, um, so uh, show that again and then talk about it. Certainly didn't print that way, right? There was some were there some other things that were on it that you had to cut off, or how does that work? Well, for the most part, it would print sort of flat, so you're going up as it prints, right? And it printed with the holes in it so I could put these screws in just so that I could add pieces into it and then they would slot in and they stay, hmm. right? So this is another 3D printed piece. This one specifically was printed to hold a laser pointer and then mount on my telescope. So did, I... Go ahead. Did, did you... um? Like, so did, were there plans for that you just downloaded? So did you go somewhere? I downloaded them, yeah, off of Thingiverse. Okay. So the only trick was these bolts were really hard to turn. So you'll notice that they're blue now versus this is black. Hmm. Later on, I found somebody had made a design for a, a knob that I've changed and modified it. And then I used a... Um, soldering iron to heat up the bolt and I slipped it down. So now it's kind of welded onto the bolt and it stays there. So it's easy to turn and loosen and get the laser pointer out when I'm not using it. Yeah. And, and um, so I'm assuming like, so when you say you modified those plans, so when you download these plans, is there some software that you use to modify it? I mean, is it, is it pretty easy to do or do you have to kind of know what you're doing? Um, I didn't know how to do it initially, but I kind of taught myself how. There's an open source program called Slicer, which is L uh, S L I C 3 R. And generally, um, objects that you download to print are in a specific format. And then they're more portable that way. But each printer is slightly different. Say so like your nozzle size, um, the thickness of the filament that you're using. So you need to put those parameters in the slicer program and then you convert it to code that will run only on your printer. Hmm. And there's other settings like I want the density of the print to be 90% or 50%. So it'll make the print thicker with material, but it's still the same dimensions. So you know how like you have a, um, a honeycomb pattern? Mm -hmm. It will make the honeycomb smaller to make it more robust of a piece of equipment. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially kind of like a video editing piece of software where it takes in all the different formats and then you put in what format you want out and it'll just kick out kind of a format that could be used on whatever device you're trying to use it on. Same yeah, sort of exactly. idea. Yeah. Okay. So when we, when we all bought regular printers with paper, you know, we just set them on the desk, throw some paper in it, connect it to your computer. You might in the old days, you might struggle to get the right drivers or get it on the network today. Mm -hmm. That Wallace, I just bought, we had our, our printer went down and it went down hard. And so 
it went into recycle and I just went to Walmart and bought a $75 printer that's works just perfect. Like set it up, I was done, right? With a 3D printer set up, what would I expect if I've never done this before? What should I expect from a setup time and just kind of, you know, you said, well, I wasn't good at it at first, but after I started doing this, realistically, what's the ramp up time? If I, if I wanted to start doing this, what's the ramp up time? Zero to productively printing parts. I did it in about a week, you know, a couple hours a night, and I was concentrating on small items so that I could do rapid printing to see where I would get used to it. Um, a lot of the problems I encountered were the settings for my printer. So it was all tuning my settings to be repeatable every time I would print. The settings were nice. Um, temperatures on the printer are very important. So when you're actually melting the plastic, you're talking like 200 degrees C. Mm. And the bed has a temperature too, roughly 50 to 60 centigrade. Everything's in metric because these are all around the world, except for, of course, United States. So you kind of quickly get to learn metric pretty well when you're working with the printer, at least I have. And I'm finding that measuring in metric has been a little bit easier when I'm doing projects, especially like, oh, it's, it's 10 centimeters. I don't have to do some weird division with fractions. Yeah. <laughs> and I've bought two reels of filament and I haven't used, I've only used half of each reel. Each reel is around 20, 25 bucks and they're a kilogram of material. And I've printed so much stuff. I haven't used up a whole reel yet. So you, I mean, you've used about $20 worth of material for everything that you've printed since you got it. Yep. Wow. Okay. So when somebody says, how much does this cost? I'm like, that's hard to say unless I weigh it and then factor in my time. That's the only way I can kind of figure it out. And some of this stuff, it just doesn't weigh anything almost. It's very light. You know, we, um, we have a, a place here in Omaha called Do Space, and they've got big 3D printers there. Have you, have you used anything like that? You got one at home. You're like, okay, these are slow and small. I may need a bigger part. Have you shipped anything over there or done anything on bigger printers um, when you needed to? We have a bigger printer at the Brain Exchange where we work. And that one was kind of cool. We were just getting to learn how to use it last summer. This is well, like summer of 2017. And it was not giving us consistent results. And it was very frustrating. I was outputting more stuff on my small one than we were on the one that was 10 times as much in the terms of cost. I think it was three grand. And so I just kept using all the small ones to do my stuff. So, but earlier this summer of 2018, I was thinking just how my printer was kind of weird until I got all my settings right. I'll read a bunch of forums and see what other people have done and actually got their config files, fed them in the slicer, and then I started getting very consistent results on that bigger printer. Oh, interesting. So um, this piece was actually printed on the bigger printer. That printer, you can just tell with a light sheen on it, this is a much higher quality print than these other ones. Because you can kind of see some amount of material on the end where it's not as perfect. But this one is just so much better. Very clean, very straight. The nozzle on this printer was much nicer from a quality standpoint. What What do you think? What's the retail of the printer you guys have in the Brain Exchange? You think it's around three thousand? Okay. So, so I, and I think at the Do Space, I think that's very similar, right? I think they have some pretty nice printers there. Yeah, right? they've got like. Um, I think they have shrouds on top of theirs mm -hmm. so it can be quiet in the room when you're in there. Yeah. And do you know the pricing? Do you know how that works there of um, how you pay for those? If you're bringing your own material, it's different. Okay. You reserve it just like you reserve a, a library book because it's an extension of the library. Okay. I had a friend 
who's in the Omaha, Astro Omaha Astronomical Society with me, in the run-up to the eclipse in 2017, he printed a whole bunch of pieces to make solar filters for his binoculars. Hmm. And I thought, that's a great idea. I think I'll do the same thing, too. So I found somebody who kind of made an object to print. And so I went and got it and printed it. I had to make it smaller for my printer. But you can, this the filter materials on the inside of it. So it's so very reflective. Outside ring and then just insert that filament in there. Yeah. Then, right. I, then, then there was like a lens cap that I printed that goes over the top of it. So nice. it just slides on the end of my camera lens. It was very, very handy to have. Let me tell you. Well, there's so many pieces like that. Like as you're starting to talk about the things you've used it for, there's so many small items that I've gone and ordered off Amazon for like nine, ten dollars. I can't imagine how cool it would be. Number one, it'd be fun to print out the own, you know, your own replacement parts. But like things like that are a perfect example of something that actually you probably wouldn't be able to buy anywhere. Or if you could, it'd probably be pretty expensive because it'd be really, you know, it's a niche item. And uh, that's what I'd be excited for is to start finding the things that are. I can just make and make better or replacement parts, things like that. Have you um, have you done any like replacement parts for things that you would have had to go out and buy a part for otherwise? I'm always breaking plastic connectors off of things. That's that's what I'm thinking of. Like I can't even think like on my mower, there's a latch that was plastic for some reason and that broke off. And I was like, man, it would be it would be there's nowhere you can buy a replacement part. They just don't make them. I'm trying to get something like that. Um, I haven't found. I haven't broken something that I've printed a replacement part for, not that I can remember, but I did find um, a mounting plate for the rechargeable batteries for my lawn mower and weed eater. So you can slide the batteries on the wall and mount them on these things so they're all nice and... Nice. That one took a while to print. I need, I need to print more because it was like four or five hours. <laughs> And to print did somebody just one? do that? I mean, is it just somebody putting that plan together? Is that kind of, yeah. and then you just grab it and they'll specify what it's for and they'll upload it to the community and then mm -hmm. you can just, you can download it and print it? Yeah. I mean, I, common search terms I've put in were like camera, telescope. I mean, there's an entire telescope that you can print. You have to get your own glass and put it in there. But if you just go to Thingiverse and type in something, you'll find it. Let me put that in the show notes while I'm yeah. thinking about it. Yeah, it's um, you know, I, I find it interesting. Like, so when when they're thinking about, so I, so to Mike's point, so he's got this part on his mower, he breaks, and he can't, like, he can't find it online. So he's like, well, I'll just print it. Say he wanted, and he couldn't find it out there, and he wanted to create that part. What's the process, or do you know what's the process? What would he, what would he have to go through to design or? redesign that part in a in a you know in a program so you could print it there's a couple services one is if you have like free cad or autodesk so you're using actual cad program to do the designing and printing another one that i really like is um tinkercad and that's all online you can do the whole design inside the web browser and then download the object and print it. Wow. That's cool. That, that's but, it, free but that's too. not easy though, right? I mean that No. That stuff's not easy. I mean it, your your best bet is to find it somewhere and print it, right? Yeah. Or if you know somebody who who's done a lot of 3D design, you can kind of con them into helping you out. <laughs> um so I, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I did a part for a friend of mine that I printed out earlier this year, he was working on a Millennium Falcon model and he wanted to mount the model on a tripod stand. So it looked like it was flying. So I printed the part out and we took it to his house and then he glued it inside the model. So he had kind of found the design slightly and modified it for his model and we did it. Yeah, and, and so I'm at Thingiverse and some things like a stackable can rack like I was just looking for one of those on Amazon. You know, we got a new fridge down here and we've been putting sodas in it. And right now they're going in the the vegetable drawer in the bottom. And every time you open that thing, you know, the cans fly around, you know, mm -hmm. like 
man, it would be really nice to have in, you know, I can look 20 bucks on Amazon. It's here tomorrow. Right. Don't get me wrong. Super easy. But uh, it's just funny. That was one of the very first things that popped up. It was just like, oh, yeah, here's a stackable can rack you could print. That's pretty cool. I've done searches for um, like battery holders, like AA battery holders. There are so many designs out there to just store your batteries or like little packs with the caps on the end. You can put it in a bag so they stay together and. If you think of a design, they've probably already got it out there. It's yeah, amazing somebody, what people have done. It. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super cool. Planters, uh, some of those, lots of toys, lots of kind of gadgets. But, you know, there are people who have put together, you know, the plans for you. And it's just a matter of getting them printed and getting it done. What kind of, you've got some telescopes behind you. Have you printed, have you had to print any parts for those? Yes. In fact, um, that laser pointer one. That will actually mount on top, and I can use that during what we call outreach with the public, so that they can kind of see um, where the telescope, where the telescope's pointed in the sky. Like this is where that object is that you're seeing right now. Exactly. So you printed the entire mount, the part that connects to there, and then you also the part that's probably on top of the telescope. Luckily, I already had a receiver on the telescope, but. The receivers are available to print as well. <laughs> so you can usually find them and print them up and then have them. I can add them to other telescopes if need be. Wow. So uh, before, you... the sh before the show, John, we, we posted in our Burst community discord that we would be talking about 3D printing and, and uh, crypto. And uh, one of the listeners out there, uh, Thoth Loki, I guess he said, I won't be able to join us tonight, but to printing in crypto, you are my best friend. Add lasers to that, and you're my best friend forever. So, so I added a laser, yes. <laughs> there we go. We snuck the laser in. But, but John, so, like, if you're trying to point that in the sky, that that you put that on top of the laser and sight that thing in, and it, like, you can see that thing go out there and get it sighted mm -hmm. in where it's going? Really? Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. So, surprisingly enough, many years ago, the U.S. Air Force had a project where they were using lasers in the sky. And the project revolved around um, optics. So this has now been adopted for most large observatories around the world. It's just, a sol it's just called adaptive optics. The telescope on these observatories, they shoot a laser beam out into the sky and it creates a false star, essentially, for the telescope to see. So it can adjust all the mirrors and get rid of the atmospheric noise just by focusing on that laser. So if you've ever seen the videos on YouTube of like the, the uh, telescopes in Chile, you'll see the telescopes kind of moving around in a, in a time lapse, and you'll see the laser beam shoot out every so often. And that's how it aligns it. itself? That's yeah. how it focuses, essentially, that? Yeah. Wow. It's pretty slick. The Air Force came out with it in like the late 80s, early 90s. And then everybody just started adopting it. Now, I'm not using it for that purpose. It's more of a sighting in where to go, showing people where the telescope's pointed. It's a nice visual indicator for them. Or you can say, I'm looking at this constellation. You can trace out the constellation with the uh, laser pointer. Hmm. Needless to say, we do not point these at any aircraft <laughs> at all well that's what you were saying so how powerful is that laser this and... one i think is around 25 milliwatt 25 okay so it is fairly bright behind me if you're using it for presentation work um it is very bright on a reflected screen <laughs> don't use it on a whiteboard probably not it'll be very yeah. reflective um if you didn't know, your eyes are kind of programmed to be very receptive to green. So it might look bright because of that. Hmm. So that's kind of why we use them in astronomy, because you can kind of see them for a great distance. Interesting. Where'd you get that one at? Amazon. Okay. But that was around six, seven years ago. I don't think they have them anymore for this power range. I mean, you can... Right. 
you can there are videos where you can take these apart and turn up the diode but you really shorten the life of them so that thing's not going to pop a balloon or anything it's not one of those lasers no no okay would it john if so say i'm out you know sighting things in and i just happen to hit the international space station as it's going by they probably is, won't see it it's, we would it's, see it's, it's, yeah it'd be diffuse enough by then okay. by that by that the, that point it wouldn't uh cause dust to to uh <laughs> to poof up on the moon no <laughs> i'm just joking we were although, joking about that. although you can point it and go pew pew anytime you want right <laughs> Yeah, but from a from a trying to sight in in the night sky, kind of where you're going, powerful mm -hmm. enough to send that beam out so people could kind of see, yeah, where you're pointing. And a lot of times, you know, we'll have a group of people around us, and you can say, "We're looking at this," and you shine it off in the sky. Every single time, there's a kid right next to you that says, "Oh, can I have that?" It's like, no, <laughs> this is not for you. <laughs> the kid's best dream right you get to shine a laser into the sky play around with yes, it. yes exactly shine it in dad's eyes yeah <laughs> now he won't see where me getting out of the house but back in a prior day uh, i worked with some guys i was in a support uh battalion for the army and we worked on generation equipment but the guys next to us were all the laser guys and of course you know they would they would light up things for targets and then that's where the missiles <laughs> would go. Yeah. And uh, and so they, they had some high power, um, some high power lasers. John, you've got some uh, telescopes behind you. Let's talk a little bit about those. What do you got behind you? And and how? Why do you use them? I mean, in the in the last show you were on, you talked a little bit about going out. You guys went out to South Dakota, uh, Val south of Valentine, Nebraska. South of, okay, so here in Nebraska, for kind of a, a viewing event. Mm -hmm. tonight it's cloudy we can't do much today speaking of that though before well no let's do that first what do you got behind you okay over this shoulder i have a um celestron evolution it is like one of their nice telescopes this one was introduced a few years ago this has a, a built-in wi-fi adapter a built-in battery pack and it's totally, it's actually been tracking this entire time, although I'm not got any targets in it. I can hear the servos whirring as it's doing things. Um, the telescope tube is nine and a quarter inches in diameter. And the focal length is around 2,800 millimeters. So you know how your camera, you have like a 35 millimeter camera. This is like 2,800. So it can go and bring things in pretty good. I've only had this since the summer. I got it to go on that trip. This is my first fully tracking, full go-to telescope. So you can actually use the hand controller and say, I'm going to look at this, and it just moves and looks, points at it. So by fully tracking, what do you mean? When you said you can hear it tracking, what, what, is that, what does that mean to someone who doesn't know anything about telescopes, a.k.a. So, me? Okay, <laughs> this has got a motorized mount. And it's got servos. So you have azimuth, you know, like around, like north, south, east, west. And you have altitude, so up and down. So there's two motors in the base, one that rotates it one way and one that goes up and down. Okay. So we call that an alt azimuth mount or alt as. And the go-to means it has a computer that has a database of objects. So as long as it knows where you are on the earth and the current date and time, and you've aligned it to a couple of set stars, you can say, go to this, and it'll just, whoosh, and then look at it. Oh, wow. Okay. So so do you plug in the like the GPS coordinates of where you're at, or how, how does it? Generally, go? yeah. Okay. Um, you can actually buy a GPS module that plugs into it, that feeds all that data into it if you want. I'm thinking about building one out of Bluetooth and kind of, hard wiring my own item in that I can plug in just to okay. see if I can do it. Um, let me see if I can, it has a hand controller. So if I was to like, I don't know if it'll show it rotating very much over there. Yeah, it does. Totally. And then I can make it go up. And the but nice... most of the time, are you just plugging in what you want to look at, or do you actually do the manual adjustments? 
most of the time I'm plugging stuff in. Um, it can be a little off. So like, okay, I'm going to cite on Polaris first so I know where my position is on the North Star. Then I'll have to cite another star like in the another part of the sky. And the computer is pretty much on. Okay. But when you get on a target, it might be slightly off, but you can do fine adjustment on the motors. It, it would be off maybe because GPS isn't as accurate or... Yeah, it could be slight. Or my time might be a few seconds off. Yeah. So you have to put every second in sometimes. And it'll stay tracking on that, right? So you're watching it and it's it's staying up to date, trying to keep it, kind of keep that in line as you're moving? Yes. Okay. So I could like walk away for 45 minutes, come back, and it should still be in the target. Yeah. It just, you, you plug that in, it's got batteries? What's the... Yeah, this one has a battery pack built in. Okay. The previous models didn't have a battery pack. You had to add your own into it. So how long does that battery last? This one's rated for 10 hours. Okay. So if you're doing an all night a session, that's pretty much it. Uh, Ryan Kirshner out in the chat room uh, wanted to know uh, if you'd mentioned, have you streamed the scope somewhere like nightskynetwork.com? Not yet. No. Um, I started building a Raspberry Pi adapter that would go in the telescope for maybe doing some of that later on. Would you do that, that would be pretty cool. locally? Like, would you do that out of your backyard? Would you, I mean, there's a lot of light noise here in the Omaha yes. area. I would there's think, a lot right? of light pollution here in Omaha. In my part of town, all the objects are kind of nice to the south. So I'm looking through Omaha to see them. So it's a bit washed out. Um, there's a location I can go to that's usually around an hour away down in Weeping Water. That's pretty good, but there's like no internet connection mm, down there. Yeah. That's the that's the drawback to isolated spots here in Nebraska. You can guarantee there's no connectivity where you're out there. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a YouTuber, um, his handle is Astro Backyard, and he does stuff from his backyard. And the results that he does are amazing. And he's in a pretty high uh, light pollution area. So it kind of gives me some hope that I could do some amount of viewing and maybe streaming. I've done pictures through it. I've done like the moon and a couple things. And does it do that internally? So you can take pictures through it or do you have to add a device on that? I have to add a the... device onto it. Okay. I have an adapter for my camera. Um, I've taken apart the, um, you know, the Logitech 920 webcam. Yeah. I've completely taken it out of the case and 3D printed a piece that goes in the eyepiece. Oh, nice. See, that's so you could a, stream it. That's, that's awesome. Great, <laughs> yeah. That's a great reason to have a 3D printer, right? You're not going to find that part anywhere. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great application for it. John, we had talked about trying to maybe set something up tonight where you would stream it into here. Um, it's too cloudy tonight. We're expecting snow. We mentioned that uh, at the beginning of the show. We're expecting some snow and some flurries tomorrow. Um, but if I wanted to, could, could I go and can I control, I mean, so yeah, I can stream, but are there places I could go and see things sure. and maybe control them? Some people do stream on YouTube. Um, there's some astro imaging guys that do, uh, hangouts on Sunday nights. Usually they talk about how they do their equipment and how they set up and do pictures and they do live streaming on there. Um, there is a site called itelescope.net. They're a nonprofit, and they allow you to view through telescopes. If you become a member and pay them their cost per month, then you can reserve time on their telescopes and actually do observations through their scopes and then save the images for yourself. Wow. So you wouldn't even, if you want to try and get into this, you wouldn't need to necessarily go out and buy one, head out to one of these sites and try it out, see if it's something you're into, and then invest in a nice telescope. Mm hmm Cool. What would, so, what's the cost on something like that, John? Do you know? The one behind me or one of these big ones that they're no, using no, remotely? The, to, to rent one, yeah, to rent one remotely. It's like 20 bucks a month. That's not too, that's cheap. Yeah, it's pretty yeah, cheap. Yeah, that and might it's be a, a nonprofit, so you're kind of helping right. them run stuff. Yeah, no, right on. I mean, I think that would be um, 
uh, that would be really cool to be able to just kind of get into it without having to, because how much is the one behind you? If I wanted to sink some money into this thing, what's what's the retail on that? Um, one? The Celestron was around two thousand. Throw the and make sure before the end of the show you throw a link to that somewhere where we can. Okay. We could see that as well. So yeah, you're making a little investment. I mean, it's not quite a car, but it's no. a little more than an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, from from a telescope perspective. My other big scope that I've got uh, is called a Dobsonian mount, and it's totally manual, right? I think I spent 500 on that. So this is a significant jump, but none of my other telescopes have motors. None of them have go-to. This one has it, and the amount that I saw through this scope this summer, just in the three or four nights that we had, totally blew away my observation record in any of my scopes, just because... You have to push it, and you got to find it, and you got to do this and look at the chart, and this saves so much time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more looking time and less searching time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I you... mean, I get so frustrated, like, oh, I can't find it. Why am I? I just this is so much better. You can just put <laughs> in the coordinates. Yeah, you're like, oop, there it is. Yeah. Um, you had put a link to a photo album in the show notes for us. We'll include those in the show notes for the show. I've also put them in the chat room for those of you, if you want to look back and do that. Talk through what um, this, I'm assuming this photo album was from summer when you were out there. And is this just all the pictures you captured while you were out there? Yeah, the verse three, um, one is just my big scope that I had for a long time. But there is a picture of the sun during the eclipse from August of 2017. And the telescope I was using, a little small green one. I didn't need a huge telescope to view the sun, but the rest of the pictures were from this summer, like the star pictures and uh, the moon picture was from this summer. And then at the, the very end of that album is just pictures of the scope close up. I was going to try and show that album <laughs> and the, uh, the hangout is locked up. So I may disappear. <laughs> if oh. I disappear, Mike, just take over on this side. I am uh I'm locked up. My picture on this side uh -oh. is locked up. You, everybody's locked up. But I can see in the live stream, I'm still good. No, I think we're, I think we're still okay. I was going to try. You'll have to go out and uh, and get that um, get that album yourself. the 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 link is both in the show notes and uh, there in the chat room. But um, yeah, so John, I, I the, one of the very first pictures is that. Did you have to view that through that lens that we saw earlier that you made? Um, to um, how'd that work? Luckily, I had a, a larger one. So it covered the entire end of the telescope. So that's the important thing about solar filters is they always go at the beginning of your optical chain. In the 80s, they were selling those department store telescopes and said, oh, you can view the sun. And they made you this little filter that would screw on the eyepiece. But if you think about it, all the light is concentrated on that point and it would melt. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and that's what would happen to your eye if you were looking through it you would melt your eye. Yeah. Um, there were stories of people who were looking at the eclipse last summer and they had crescent shaped burns in their eyes because they didn't use protection. Yikes. So wow. it's like very scary uh, occurrence. Like, please don't look at the sun. It's not you know, good. You know, what's scary right now is every single browser on my, on my PC right now <laughs> is not responding. Uh, somehow the, the video is still coming through. So, I'm 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 a little blind of the show notes because I can't get to them. Oh. <laughs> uh, I can't get these to pictures are fantastic though. I can't wait for everyone to take a look at these. These are really cool. I was wondering what type of shots you were getting, and uh, these are fantastic. So the the pictures of like the Milky Way, I will confess those were not through the telescope. Those were just through my camera. Okay. I just put them on a tripod and let them sit for like forty seconds. But you can get a tracking mount so that the camera moves with the earth rotation so you don't get streaks. That's what usually happens when you're doing long exposures. Just even those slight movements are enough to give you those streaks. Okay. Yeah, right. like anything over 15 seconds and you'll get a streak, usually. So oh, one of those cool. is like a 40-second exposure. There's one that almost looks like it's like a fisheye. And actually, I could, I could probably share it here. Let me see if I can do it. Uh, yeah, that is a fisheye, actually. Is it? 
the nice thing about fisheye is they're really wide. So it's more forgiving about the amount of time that you do your exposure. Okay. So this one was also just on your camera then. Yeah. Okay. The glow that you see off to the right in the right lower there. right. Yeah. That's weeping water, Nebraska. Is it really? Yeah. Okay. So that shows you how much light, even in a long exposure photograph, you'll see. Yeah, these are really cool. Okay, so I, these are the ones you were talking about. That this is just your camera? Yep. Wow. I would I would have never guessed that was just your camera. That's a really cool shot of the moon, too. Yeah, so that's my camera set up on the telescope, the big scope behind me. I was using That was the first time I'd ever hook a camera up to it. I just wanted to see what I could do with it. That's a that is so sharp, cool. That's a pretty sharp picture. It is, yeah. That is super cool. So the and of course, he's one... pointing his laser at it, and there's clouds of smoke <laughs> coming, off the, <laughs> coming off the moon. Go ahead, John. So the... Um, that was kind of a nice, well, I'm waiting for the kit. Cause we had an outreach event for all the Papillion Levista kits. It's like, I've got a few minutes to kill. What can I do? Well, I'll try to hook the camera up. It's not exactly dark yet. So the, the moon won't be like super bright, but it'll be enough for me to do an exposure on the camera. Most of the time when you have that much moon face and you're trying to take a picture of it, you get horribly overexposed or you have to put filters on to darken the image to get some detail out. But if you get it in twilight, you know, where it's up in the sky, it comes out pretty good. It, which is so weird. You would never think that the moon was giving off enough light to be overexposed. But when you've got that much magnification on it, I guess that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like focusing on a light bulb in a dark room. Yeah, because then you don't see anything around it. Right. You just see the light. It's the same principle. Very Man, cool. I really want to scroll through these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sucks just to have your computer locked up. You know, you don't realize how dependent you are on it until uh, everything uh, everything kind of locks up. John, what's ahead for you when you when you're you got any plans um, as you think about? I mean, we're going into winter. I don't know if that's something you go out, you bundle up and go out and try and do it. But when, when you think about events coming up, any, anything around around this? Well, now that you mention that, um, this Tuesday at Lake Zarinsky. If it's clear, then we'll probably be out there. We have an outreach event that night. There's usually three or four of us out there with scopes. A lot of people, if, if it's moderate this time of year, they usually have people come out. It'd be a little chilly. Tuesday mm -hmm. night would be a little chilly, but, but do you get, you get some students you just get, how do you advertise for that? Usually on Facebook. Okay. So like, um, the Omaha Astronomical Society. Their website is omahaastro.com. We've got roughly 90 to 100 members. And there's usually built-in events every month that we do. Um, the second Tuesday of every month, we're always out at Zarinsky if it's not cloudy. During the summer months, there's usually a Friday closest to new moon out at Lake Mahoney at the golf driving range. There were usually a lot of people out there. And that usually brings in like anywhere from uh, 50 to 150 people walking through, looking through scopes. I bet that's a perfect location to do it too. Out it there, is, a little bit, a little bit further slope. away. Yeah. yeah. And what else? Um, you know, just being a member of the club, it's only 25 bucks a year. But if you don't have a telescope, they have a telescope loan program. So you could actually try before you buy any number of different types of telescopes through the club. Really? Mm-hmm. And you're just going to go borrow, and is it from other members that you're borrowing from, or do they have their own collection of telescopes? The club has its own collection, yeah. Okay. There's been some that were donated. Um, you know, Hayneedle, they used to have a telescope division that they for a number of years ago. They had donated two scopes that we got, I think about five or six years ago. So those are still out there that you can just rent, or I mean, not rent, borrow. Right. Pe people sign up to get a specific scope, and we have a, a loan chairperson, and he maintains the list of who gets what. So he'll collect them, or you know, meet up, say, let's go get, let's meet up together, and you can borrow the scope or you return the scope. 
Yeah. So are these, are there some of them like the go-to scopes or are all of them manual? They're, they're all manual. Okay. Um, teaching a new person how to use a, a go-to scope can be a bit of a challenge. Um, we've had a few people who've, you know, I just got this telescope and you spend an hour at an outreach event showing them how the telescope works, which is good because they're learning, you're learning patience. And um, the more people you can get into the hobby, you know, the better off we all are. I just hope that they don't get too frustrated and then sell it. Right. right. Oh, now right, it's right. gone. Yep. Which I'm going to segue into another telescope for the moment that I also had behind me. So this little telescope is from a nonprofit called Astronomers Without Borders. And believe it or not, that is 199. What's the so magnification wise compared to your other one? Um, this one is 400 millimeters. So okay. not as much magnification per se. Magnification is mostly based upon your eyepiece that you put in it, but this is extremely portable. Um, three weeks ago, there was um, International Observe the Moon Night. I didn't take the big one. If you're looking at the moon, I just took this one because I can get it in the car and get there a lot easier and get it back in the car. Because setting up the big one, that's around a 30 to 40 minute commitment just to put it on site, start to do the alignments, put it together. This you can take in five minutes. <laughs> so they call this a grab and go because you just pick it up and go. But, but completely manual. It's completely manual. But, you know... The moon or the planets, fairly easy to see in this thing. What, what's from a planet perspective? What's available right now? I, isn't this a good time? Didn't I hear like all the planets are visible at at this point? So Saturn is visible. Um, Venus has already come around, so it's going to start being in the morning here later in the month. Um, Jupiter is, has been setting earlier and earlier in the evening, so it's going to be out of sight for a while because it's on the other side of the sun. But Neptune and Uranus are available to see. Mars is still up, too, in the evening sky. But most people, when they see Saturn, they're just like, oh, because they see the rings and then they're hooked. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you can see them pretty well from with, with even that telescope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can make out the rings in the division, usually. Yeah. yeah. So this organization, when you buy this scope, half the money that you put into it, they use for educational programs. So it could be in the form of sending telescopes to a, a country in Africa or providing uh, materials for an education science program for STEM in schools. They had a big thing that they did for Puerto Rico this past spring where they took a bunch of scopes down. So it's when a cool you, way to do it. Yeah, so when you buy the scope, you're helping those programs. And the fact that it's so easy to carry is, is nice because there's actually a handle on the front of it. You just pick it up on the base. They call that a tabletop just because it just sits on the table. When you, when you take that out to just view, you know, so you're going out to a big dark field. Do you have, do you put it on a tripod? Do you put it on your car? I mean, what do you, what does it sit on to view? You can use a picnic table. Okay. If you have a nice tripod, the scope will actually come off the base if need be, so then you can mount it on like a regular tripod if you want. Not a camera tripod though, it's sort of like an astronomy tripod. There's a, a plate that runs along the side of the scope. They call it a, a Vixen dovetail. It's just a, an angled piece of metal that fits into a, a saddle, then you tighten it down. Not the traditional camera screw, similar, no. but, but bigger, right? Yeah, because there's so much more weight involved in this, it is a larger plate. And the and the Vixen dovetail seems to be like the most uh, eponymous thing that you find for mounting telescopes because it's so easy to slide the rail in, you turn one knob, and it's in. But you so still how long have to do a little balancing, but on those manual ones, you know, for when you're when you're helping a newbie out. 
how long until they really become proficient in, in, you know, finding what they're looking for? Um, it can vary. Okay. So if, if they have, huh, let's see, how should I put this? If they've got very good eyesight, they can usually pick stuff out of the sky just by looking. I mean, they have these things called naked eye objects, right? So I can say, oh, if you're at a dark site, I can go, oh, there's the Andromeda galaxy just by looking into the spot where it's supposed to see. And you see a faint fuzzy. That's pretty good. Um, but if they can read a chart and know times of the year based on the chart, you can usually home in on something pretty easily. Okay. There's a guy... Uh, his name was Charles Messier, and he was looking for comets. This is a long time ago. Yeah, with a name and, like Messier, it's got to be like 1875. Yeah. Or something. So he he got annoyed that he kept finding the same things over and over again that weren't comets. So he made a list of them so he would remember, okay, I'm not looking at that because I already know what it is. But surprisingly... It's one of the more popular catalogs of what people use today to look at stuff because they're all the cool things you can see, even with binoculars. So, like, um, there's a constellation in the winter months called Orion. You've probably heard of it. Mm -hmm. In below the belt of Orion, there is a uh, nebula called the Orion Nebula, and they call that M42. So Messier 42. That one, you can just about see some color in binoculars. Normally when you're looking at objects, it all looks black and white. Yeah. Because you're because you're way your eyes are. But you can make out some amount of pink sometimes out of the Orion Nebula just because it's so big in the sky. So this with Messier objects would work pretty good. I mean, if you could use binoculars, that would give you so much better. And following hole. the charts and everything on the Messier charts, I mean, you could yeah. pick it up decently fast. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. They, they call that star hopping. It's like, okay, I go to this one, to this one, to this one. It's all right. I mean, humans are great at recognizing patterns, right? That's why we have constellations. Oh, makes sense. Easier to find when you know a group of them, what they would look like. Mm -hmm. Recognizable. Okay. Uh, Ryan Kirshner in the chat room, he just shared a link with us as well. Um, that's got some additional pictures in it. Um, I'm going to put that, John, in the show notes bef below your album, and we'll uh, we'll give Ryan some credit for that as well. Uh, this is his boss he's been out with. And the last picture on that link is the M42 object, John, that you were talking about. Cool. Um, there. So it looks, it looks super cool. Um, John, with the microscope, not microscope, but the telescope. <clears throat> sorry, still a little shaken from my uh, from all the browsers locking <laughs> up. Um, I had to completely. If you're listening to the audio, I just disappeared for a while. I had to restart everything here. Um, fortunately, the way I podcast, I'm not dependent on my own computer for the the actual streaming, so that can kind of continue to go on. But, um, John, how far out can I with your with your good telescope? realistically how far can you see oh that's actually a difficult question yeah that's why i asked it so <laughs> <laughs> might be the smartest question i've asked all night so do you remember the days of department store telescopes oh it's only 60 dollars, and right, it's right. got 500 magnification well some scopes they essentially most scopes have magnification limits right you can go down so far, and then your images start to become muddy because it's just too much magnification. When you have high mag stuff, and you're using a scope that's not a go-to tracking scope, you're on high mag, and you're looking at Saturn, and Saturn does this, this in the eyepiece. It moves across, and then it's out of the field. And you have to adjust it again, and adjust it again. So all that high mag stuff means a lot more work on the individual if they're using manual telescopes. So roughly, I don't know the calculation for it, but I know that a 10 millimeter eyepiece in that telescope is close to the limit for it just because of its size. 
and it's a pretty good magnification. I can see Saturn pretty well in what they call a 14 millimeter eyepiece. And I, if I could, you take, I think it's, you take the focal length of the telescope times the um, eyepiece to get your magnification. I think that's it. But objects that are farther away would be moving, could be moving, would or should be moving slower. So when you think ah, of... that's the trick, though. Okay. The things moving through the field on your telescope is due to the Earth's rotation. Hmm. And the Earth's a constant rotation. So a telescope mount that's motorized is just compensating for Earth rotation. So you just have to worry about when does it rise and when does it set. Yeah. Okay. Because so we're Saturn, we're not compensating for Saturn moving. We're right. compensating for the spin of the Earth. Right. Stupid Earth. So <laughs> just stop spinning Earth. Gosh, Make come it a lot on. easier. You know. <laughs> there is some motion with the moon. Yeah. Because of its the way it orbits the Earth. But it's pretty much the sun's pretty much the same all the time. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 good. It's good thought. I, I, you know, yeah. We're the we're on the the closest thing that is actually spinning is the rock we're on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so relatively speaking, it's you're getting the most. Um, you're having to compensate for that spin here on the Earth. Um, no, that's that's cool. Do you see like I mean, so that motor, once you get it dialed in, it's it just keeps like as fast as the earth is moving. I mean, I think those things move fast. It's keeping up with with what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And you're not seeing any jitteriness in it. It just is pretty clear and consistent. Well, there's no real jitter. There the, um, how should I put this? There is things known as periodic error. And it has to do with like the worm gear that's used in some telescope mounts. I haven't seen it on mine. The only thing that happened, because of the way mine is set up, you know how I call that the alt as mount? Because it's in this plane and this plane. There's another mount called an equatorial mount, which is angled based upon where you are on the earth. So like, we're what, 41 degrees latitude, longitude. Anyway, the telescope is mounted at an angle to compensate for the, the placement of the sky. So if you're doing long-term astrophotography, you're probably using an equatorial mount. So it compensates for the angle. In my scope, if I was to try to do long-term photography on it, the way this mount is, the image would rotate in the eyepiece. Mm. So you wouldn't get a clean image for a number of periods. There's a, a club member in OAS. All he does is imaging. He, does, he never uses eyepieces through his telescopes. And you're talking about, he'll start doing imaging on one object and he'll spend three nights on it. Mm on one object and that's five minute exposures and he might do i don't know like a hundred photos a night he takes all those photos and stacks them together with software to get clean images out of it wow yeah his his setup is a really nice technical setup he's actually got computers mounted on each mount he remotes into them with vnc He's got his own Wi-Fi network on site. He's got five deep cycle batteries to run everything and a generator. And it's like a big computer center out in the field. It's great. Any, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Yeah. Sure. And his pictures are up on the Omaha Astronomical Society website in the, uh, the gallery. It's some amazing stuff. Mike, you were going to say something? Well, no, he, okay. he he answered it. <laughs> Ryan uh, Ryan just added an image to that uh, library he gave us, and then said, um, "It's his boss's scope. The, uh, he has an equ equatorial. Is that right? Equatorial mm -hmm. mount. So he's got one of those. His that's cool. That's a big. That yeah, is that's, a, 
Oh, that's an Edge HD. Yeah, that's a nice scope. The um, are those are those are those weights at the bottom of that? Thing? Yeah, because yeah. that's a heavy scope. So those weights are the counterweight to balance it on the mount. Kind of keep it that way. <clears throat> I think I'm losing my voice. I ran some stairs today, <laughs> and I hadn't done that in a while. And that's not. I shouldn't do that on Thursdays before I podcast. It's you get this, <clears throat> you get stair lungs, and uh, it just it's, it just tears them to shreds. So, John, anything else uh, before we kind of wrap it for you and let you go? Anything else that you've uh, uh, along these lines? Anything I missed? I got really distracted when I, when the system went down. But anything else? If you're interested in astronomy and the stars, and you want to get started. The best advice is use binoculars or go out and buy binoculars because then you can get your appetite wet with something that you can use at night and during the day. And then maybe jump into one of the little $200 or $300 scopes like this one behind me. That way, rather than going and getting one of those $60 or $70 scopes from the department store, you get so much more light gathering on that piece of equipment. That, that one sky telescope from Astronomers mm -hmm. Without Borders mm -hmm. That's a five inch di a diameter mirror. It gathers so much more light than some of the smaller scopes. You would be a lot more surprised and happy with it. Can I buy that just directly from their site? If, yes, if they have a store something? section. Okay. I saw a tweet last week said that they were back in stock for the holidays. Oh, nice. <laughs> Click on shop and then, um, oh, 199 bucks. Yeah, US only. AWB One Sky Reflector Telescope, US only 199. You can get those, I imagine, plus shipping. Probably is going to be thirty or forty bucks, maybe, mm -hmm. to get to, to get that shipped to you. But two fifty, that's not bad. I mean, I was just looking at a three D printer for one hundred ninety eight, so or one hundred eighty nine. So yeah, not not bad to get you if you're if you're interested, John. I imagine um, uh, you in the work that you do, kids love this stuff, right? You probably see a lot of kids when you're doing this really kind of geek out on it. Yeah. In fact, um, in one of our programs, we just started an Astro Explorers Club. So we're talking about the night sky and the stars and things like that. And tomorrow's our second session during the afternoon. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, cool. Yeah. You, you'd be good at that. I think you like, you like working in that space. And I think with telescopes and some of the stuff we're doing, I mean, this is the perfect merger just tonight. You know, we talked about 3d printing lasers and telescopes, <laughs> mm -hmm. like that's pretty cool. And, and, you know, not even maybe 50 years ago, 30 years ago, all, I mean, this is a field that has, I think benefited from technology, uh, getting better things, getting faster GPS, which didn't exist. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm thinking 30 or 40 years ago, um, I did this as a kid. We we had an astronomer in our church, and he was looking for comets. And so that was real popular. They would go out. He'd spend four or five hours in a night sweeping the sky. It was super boring. But I, I was I was I was really interested. I went out with him one night and I watched the he set me up with a really nice pair of binoculars. And and he took me out on a night when the moon would rise right after we got there. And it was a full moon. Like he picked the perfect night. He didn't he didn't sandbag on me. He gave me a great night. And so he put the binoculars on a tripod and then just said, okay, in about mm -hmm. five minutes, the moon's coming up. Watch it. And for the next 20 minutes or so, I watched the, you know, the moon rise and then kind of tracked it uh, on its way up. And I was hooked. Like, I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. And, uh, and I've always had a sweet spot. He eventually did find... Don Mockholtz is his name. He eventually did find a comet. Nice. Uh, five, I don't know, five, well, maybe 10 years after that or so. Um, but he would go out, you know, one night a week and look for these, you know, look for these comets. That was kind of his, that was kind of his hobby, um, which was, which is really cool. So I'd see him scan a section and write something down. Then he'd you know, scan another section and write some things down. But he had one of those big, long, he had a long. So it be like a refractor. Maybe. Yeah. It's all yeah. glass. Yeah, I, I remember him hauling it out of the car and setting it up, and it probably took him half an hour to get it all set up and dialed in, and and wait, you know, we went out in the evening and wait for it to get dark. Stuff we 
went up in the hills. Bay Area, it was it's, Bay Area is hard to get away from the light, even harder today than it was then. Um, yeah. But but um, we we went up in the hills and did some stuff, and it was really really cool. I was super impressed um, with it, and I'm super impressed. I don't. I would never want to. I'm not disciplined enough for this stuff. It takes time and. You know, it's just like, uh, but I appreciate you guys that uh, that do do that and bring back some really great pictures that uh, that really highlight what's going on. Of course, you know, we've seen in our generation, you know, Hubble has just changed the equation. Oh, yeah, exactly. Right? When yeah. we think about astronomy and how we understand the universe now, I mean, Hubble, and I think kids, you know, this is one of those, those things where we have a generation of kids who don't really know days before we didn't have these awesome Hubble mm -hmm. uh, pictures, right? And it's like, hey, guys, it hasn't always been this way. Like, we, we didn't know a lot of things about 50 years ago. Uh, 1968, 50 years ago, if you, if you go back, I was reading an article today about what the world was like in 1968, the year I was born. And you're like, wow, we have come a long ways. Just from yeah. having podcasts, live streaming around the world, we could literally be anywhere just about uh, with Wi-Fi in the world. And then some amazing pictures that uh, that you guys have taken. John, thanks for taking the time tonight. Always great to have you on. I appreciate you giving us an hour of your time to jump in here. Thanks for the work that you do in the city of Omaha as well. Um, it's welcome. really cool to see the... Uh, to see the work. I'm glad you're getting a chance to work with students. That's one of my favorite things to do too. You know, we've got a high school program as well. And um, I've got a student this year, we opened up the, our coding program to mm. hardware um, projects. If they wanted to do, it had always been software. And we kind of said, I'll do anything. We just wanted to see what would happen. And we actually had a student uh, hack together. It's super cool. We have two students doing it now. They've taken some surplus, some just parts of screen and some some boards and they're bringing in a raspberry pi and they're creating nice. their own digital assistant using oh. python like python to create a digital assistant that's cool yeah it's super cool and um and they're geeking out they said to me the other day oh one of them said um do we it, the program ends at one you know we feed them lunch and then we hang out till one and we kick everybody out of there and one of the students said do we have to go I was like, yes. <laughs> that's yes. when you know you've, you've had a successful project when they're asking yeah. if they have to go. Yeah. No, John, thanks for what you do, man. Great. Great to have you on. Thanks for setting up your equipment and, uh, and, and all the stuff that you showed us tonight. I, I greatly appreciate it. Mike and I have got some things to clean up here on the show, but we'll let you go and return to the program already in progress. How's that sound? Cool. Thank you. All right, All right man. Have have a good evening. We'll uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again. We we got to get together more often than just uh, yeah Infotech and in Heartland Developer Conference. You know, I didn't even mention that you can control the scope of Wi-Fi in a tablet. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you showed that, or we might have talked about that the last time you were on. Maybe okay. Not. I don't know. But... Yeah. There's the more recent purchase no. too. The Crane. Oh, nice. The, the, the Smooth Four. Yeah. Yeah, it, we, we um, John also is a photographer for events. And so oftentimes he goes around shooting photography. You had that cool little device that I think we, I forget what it was. That little camera, we, we talked about that oh. a couple times ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that's cool stuff. So, John, thanks for coming on, man. We'll let you go, yep. let you get back to it. Thanks for jumping in. You can just hit the red uh, phone button, but thanks, man. I appreciate it. Hey. Thanks for jumping in here. Nice talk, Mike. Great, yep. great having you. Great Have a good night. You. Okay. Bye. Take care. Um, super cool. I and it's such it this is another one of those podcasts, Jim. We've talked about this. There are a few topics that I've just never explored. So I love I, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm just learning a bunch. I'm like, man, I didn't even know these things existed. Uh, and just learning the difference between all the axes and the powered versus non powered, the go to, not go to. Um I, I tell you, it'd be super cool. I, I definitely want to go out and attend one of these events. I had no idea they were doing this at Lake Zerinsky like every week, yeah. he said. Yeah. That's right down the road for me. In your, back, in your backyard. It is, there. yeah. Yeah. Right in the backyard. Yeah, no, super cool. Yeah, you should you should definitely. It's some really cool um, in, in some very niche tech. And like I said, this is an area where tech has really helped. And so um, they're, they're adding a lot of cool technology and it's just, it's super cool. So um, again, we appreciate John coming on. Um, very cool. 
Um, Mike, we are going strong in the Fitbit group. If you haven't joined us yet in there, I cannot tell you how many times I've wanted to buy an Apple watch this week though. I am not really. Yes. I don't know. Why this week? I don't know. I don't know. what's gotten into me. Like I priced one out. I went out and jumped in and, you know, four ninety nine or whatever they are, three ninety nine. Um, uh, I priced one out. I'm just like thinking, well, you know, I'm wearing a Fitbit and I'm wearing a Garmin, you know, I'm wearing two things. And I was like, I can get this down to one. And yeah, I just, I'm not able to pull the trigger, but I'm still hanging in the Fitbit group. And so if you want to join us on the Fitbit group, uh, Jim at the average guy, no, don't, don't send it there. You all email me, Jim at the average guy TV and give us, give me the email address you use for Garmin or for Fitbit. Sorry. And, uh, and I'll get you added. And, uh, basically we just friend and then every week or so someone's starting a challenge and you can jump in there to Joe ski is just killing us all. I'm not going to lie. That guy. Really? Oh my God, Mike. I thought, so I had a crazy week and I did about 108,000 steps. That's you, you got to do a lot to get 108,000 steps in a week. He literally is doing that every week. So again, whatever's worth doing is worth overdoing. So to Joe ski, nice work. On that, everybody's getting a little discouraged, but it's okay. Hang tight. Uh, Ryan says in the chat, dude is nuts with those steps. He is. And uh, and and I believe him. I, I think it's all legit, but it's a good challenge. And uh makes me think like, okay, I better step it up. I have done 108,000 uh, in there. Don says in the chat room, Jim, there's always Christmas right around the corner. It's not really Christmas, Don, when you're buying it for yourself. That's not the... But then I guess Sarah's not going to drop 400 bones on a on a watch and I shouldn't, but I've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah, I think you should. It's uh, it's been a game changer for me. I love it. No, I know. Hannah got the newest version. She did. Which that, gen is that? What do they call that? Gen? Uh, four. Four. Okay. Yep. What's four have that three doesn't have? So for the form factor of the screen changed a little bit. So it's a little bit bigger. Um, you got way less bezel. So you got a lot actually more screen than you did on the old ones. You got the EKG built in oh, uh, I, need, I need that i'm getting older yeah i'm yeah. getting older gotta have it. a lot be better self i don't know if you're going the cell model uh oh. one good way to do this too if if people are going with the cell model um you can buy it through like your verizon your sprint and at&t and you can pay it off like you do a phone right mm-hmm. interest free over six months so then it's just like uh you know i don't know 50 60 bucks a month interest free you just tack it on there and and that's a good way to good way to do it good so, way to hide it yeah, it's a good way to it not feel it as much, right? <laughs> if I looked at my Verizon bill, I'm like, man, we have three devices we're paying off. Uh, it's it's weird how fast that bill can can go up. It does. Uh, Hannah and I both have iPhone 10s that are on there. Um, so it's weird. Back forever, too, it seems like. Yeah. Don, Don said his kids gave, it, gave him one for Father's Day. And yeah, I don't think I'll talk about my family. That's something I'll probably purchase. But I've been kind of waiting for things to break so that I can really justify it. You know, Fitbit goes out or the Garmin watch goes out, then you're kind of like, okay, it's probably time to switch. So I've been thinking a ton about it. Us uh, thinking of that or thinking, speaking of that, maybe two beers was too much tonight. Don't forget, <laughs> it's going to be a really interesting crypto conversation at the end here. This last infusion, I don't know. Now it's only 4.8, so it's not. I don't, know. In your head. Whew, I don't know what's wrong with me. Uh, don't forget, we want to thank those Patreon subscribers. So if you're out there and you're doing that on Patreon, we appreciate it. The average guy.tv slash Patreon gets you there. Uh, we got plans for a buck. Super helpful. Just kind of keep the lights on and everything rolling here at the average guy. Uh, TV. Uh, don't forget if you want to email me, Jim at the average guy.tv, find me at Jay Collison. You can find Mike at Uyghur tech. Mike, you're doing a bunch of stuff on Twitch still. You've been, you've been doing it two or three weeks. Are yeah, you? I love it. Last oh, night, actually, we had a, we had one of our best streams last night. We had uh, quite a few people in there. Everyone was chatting. It was a ton of fun. Uh, found a good Discord community and and to join. And uh, yeah, so if you want to come out, we've been playing Call of Duty lately, doing the new Black Ops mode. And I, you know what? The other thing, Jim, uh, I started playing Parker. My brother-in-law has been joining me every time now. It's a much more comfortable stream. And I enjoy when I'm watching people stream, if they're talking to someone and they're not just sitting there, it's it's awkward to talk to just nothing, like talk to yourself. But if you just you're having a natural conversation with someone while you're playing together, uh, it really added a lot. Yeah, so I'm I am the dad nerd um, on Twitch, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram if you want gaming stuff. The dad nerd, uh, I'm I'm that everywhere. So yeah, come cool. on, I'd love to have you out there. That's why 
I was telling Jim, like, do I have to take this down? It kind of, it's kind of a pain to take down. I kind of forgot about it until right when we went live. I uh, got the green screen behind me for, for when we do that. Get your bandwidth fixed, too, for the first part of the show. It was really bad. Yeah, but, I did. I noticed uh, we had someone outside the house was watching Plex. Mm-hmm. Two people were watching Plex. So I had two HD streams heading out of the house, which are uh, that's what I'm stuff down. Boot him. You have to tell them Thursday nights off limits. We'll yeah. record it, but you can't come in, block them. I was going to. We don't want them in here. Just a reminder, the Average Guy TV platform, both web and media a hosting powered by Maple Grove Partners, gets secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people that you know and you trust. Of course, you know Christian, and we appreciate him for his sponsorship of hosting all that we do here. And the lights just stay on with him. So super cool, Christian. Thanks for what you do. Don't forget HomeGadgetGeeks.com if you want to get the app. Great way to get that done, get that loaded up. Um, and then uh, don't forget, like... Man, I, Mike, I've had two HelloFresh meals two nights in a row. Like tonight, Sarah had it ready when I got home. It was pretty awesome. Like I, I just can't. I just, it's, it's been great. And uh, well, it must baffle your mind that not everyone uses it. Like, yeah, the way you talk about it, it's like, man, everyone should just, I just can't use it. I was on the treadmill today, and a buddy I was talking to about it, and I'd given him a coupon, you know, that basically gives him the week for free, and and uh, we were talking about it, and then I started saying. You know what you, you want to know what I had last week? <laughs> so I got on my phone and I started going through last week's like, oh, this was really good. And then we had two two options tonight in the fridge. We had a chicken and a steak. And I thought for sure Sarah would go steak because we had chicken last night. And um and the great thing is, you know, we get these three meals and we can kind of pick three nights during the week that we want to cook them. So you just kind of and you really only have about a week. It's so fresh. Within about five or six days, some of the fresh components kind of start breaking down, right? Because you're talking about fresh. That's right. So you want to make sure you order an amount that you're actually going to be able to go through in the week. Yeah. Remember those things called vegetables? Like they come out of the ground and like no, they, go, they go back within a week. Yeah. Um, of being in there. And so I thought for sure it'd be steak. And uh, she had done the chicken cutlet uh, tonight. It was super good. It was really, really good. So then she said, I said, oh, I thought for sure you'd do steak. She's like, nope, I want you to cook the steaks. So tomorrow night, Steaks are on the menu and uh, not, not the gourmet plan. This was just the regular plan in there. So pretty cool. If you still want to, I, I get these coupons all the time, guys. Again, I don't really make anything off of this. If you want me to make something off of it, just tell me. I've got a code that does. Actually, if you want to, if I get a little credit, I think it's 30 bucks. You get 40 off. There's a link to it in the show notes. I've been putting it in the show notes over the last couple of weeks. Just go out there and use the link. Like you don't even have to contact me if you don't want to. But if I, I got bigger, I have coupons that basically give you the week free and they expire. Um, they put expiration dates on it. And um, so I need, I think these expire at the end of the month. Um, so get to me if you want to do that again. I'm not, I'm not pimping it guys. Cause I, I'm making a ton of money off this. I'm um, it's good stuff. So get it done. Hello fresh. If you want to do that to, with me, let me know. We are live every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out here at theaverageguy.tv slash live. We're going to do a little crypto. I have a bunch of Saya updates. So that'll pretty much mean everybody's going to leave the chat room. But that's okay. Mike and I will stay around for a few minutes, and uh, I'll get Mike caught up on the Saya stuff. Uh, if you come out live, you can stay for the chat. We're, we'll be back next Thursday. Big Black Friday deals coming up. So if you're into that kind of stuff, Mike and I will be going through all the Black Friday stuff we can find. Send me your Black Friday deals, Jim at the Average Guy.tv. We'll see you next week. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.